Good evening, sir. Good evening. Good evening, sir. I'm Indra. We have already met here a few days back, sir. Uh, welcome on uh, Indra's board, sir. Uh, it's pleasure. I think all of uh, my colleagues can listen to me. Uh, uh, it's a great pleasure uh, that uh, we are having uh, legion uh, anthropologist Dr. Steve Sandro Steves. Uh, we'll be having a webinar series on male infertility. It will be like it covered in a four chapters. There will be four sessions of the, these webinars, and uh, in, in first. In today's webinar, we'll be, we'll be doing about the evaluation, male evaluation, and later on, we'll progress further. But before that, I'll introduce you, Dr. Sandra Steves. He's a uh, director of the Androfert, uh, and he's dedicatedly doing an, uh, male infertility, and his personal interest is in that one. He's uh, done a lot many uh, review, review literature on that top, that on male infertility. So I think uh, sir, we all are ready and eager to listen to you because this is one topic where we are. I feel we feel like we can still do much more uh, for the bet uh, for the betterment of our patients. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. It's my pleasure to uh, speak to you about male infertility in the next uh, four webinars. Uh, it's uh, really a privilege to be able to share this knowledge with uh, doctors from Indra IVF that I know it, it is a very well respected IVF center across India and also internationally reputation is quite big. So I'm very happy to be able to speak to you today. Well, the first webinar will be on uh, male infertility workup. First of all, I just want to uh, share with you my affiliations. I'm medical and scientific director of Androfert Fertility Center in Campinas, Brazil, which is a uh, referral center for male infertility. I'm a professor at the Department of Surgery at the University of Campinas, also in Brazil, and a research collaborator at the American Center for Reproductive Medicine Cleveland Clinic in the United States, and also professor of reproductive endocrinology at Aarhus University in Denmark. Well, uh, the agenda today will be uh, mostly dedicated to the standardization of male infertility evaluation. This is the primary objective. At, at the end of this presentation, I hope you will be able to apply the knowledge that I will share with you next time you see patient complaining of male infertility. I have also some secondary objectives. Mostly I will share with you some epidemiologic considerations. Uh, I will also discuss with you briefly the relevance of male infertility and also uh, show the most important male infertility causes. So let's get started. And the first important thing to consider is the definition of male infertility. What is male infertility? It's very basic, but obviously we need to go through it because this is a disease of the male reproductive system caused primarily by factors involving the efficiency in the semen, genetic and congenital conditions, anatomical, endocrine, functional or immunological abnormalities of the reproductive system. It could be also involving chronic illness and sexual conditions in incompatible with intercourse. So what is it important to kind of discuss male infertility? Well, because we have, we face as doctors uh, providing care to the infertility patients, like a epidemic of couples complaining about infertility. We have probably around 50 to 8 million infertile couples globally. And male infertility accounts for up to 60% of the conditions affecting fertility. It can be alone in about, let's say, 35%. It 
and in another 20 25 percent it comes combined with female infertility and the estimations indicate that one in every eight men seek assistance for fertility related issues so as you can see this is something that we need to think about there are several conditions associated with male infertility there are some conditions that are diseases actually affecting the fertility potential. For instance, it could be like a patient with cryptorchidism in which the undescended testis actually is the cause of uh, low sperm count. It could be a big hydrocyl actually making pressure uh, on the testicle and then providing some conditions which is not ideal for sperm production. It could be varicocele, which is the veins around the testicles that might be dilated. It could be testicular torsion. It could be congenital abnormalities, such as the absence of the vas deferens. It could be infection affecting both the testicle and the epididymis, or one of them. And it could be also uh, small this uh, testicular size, which might be related to testicular dysfunction. Testicular dysfunction in that case could be caused by, for instance, use of radiotherapy, chemotherapy, genetic conditions making the testicle small or idiopathic. So as you can see, we have anatomic conditions affecting male infertility. But we also have some other conditions making the patients we see nowadays infertile. And these things relate to use of medication for other issues. There are several medications that might act as gonadotoxic agents than affecting fertility. For instance, we have some antihypertensives, antidepressants uh, used by many men across the globe and these drugs I will discuss then in more detail later on they will affect the ability of the testicle to make healthy sperm. The other thing relates to obesity and overweight. We know that obese men they have lower sperm counts. We also know that smoking is an important issue because there are so many toxins uh, in people with smoking uh, cigarettes that will affect fertility, mostly involving oxidative stress pathway. There are other conditions as well as exposure to environmental <clears throat> and the uh, working conditions, let's say in cities in which the air pollution is very high and also in cities in which <clears throat> They could be related to heat in the works, uh, workspace. Uh, also, studies indicating that when you have exposure to electromagnetic waves like uh, uh, the mobile phone in which you kind of talk too much, these electromagnetic waves could actually somehow affect the ability of the testicle to make sperm. So it's not only anatomic conditions or diseases that actually might compromise fertility, but also other things related to lifestyle. So, and they can come combined. I can have a patient in which he has a very cocele that we will go through during these webinars. And then in addition, on top of it, he's using some gonadotoxic medication. He might be actually smoking. He might be overweight and working in an environment which is not ideal for his fertility. So as you can see, we need to appreciate this complexity of the uh, issues that might be related to male infertility. In a study we did uh, some time ago in our center, we look at the most important conditions affecting male infertility patients that we see in this, in this uh, referral center for male infertility that is underfert. We, uh, as you can see, varicocele uh, responded for about 26.4% uh, of uh, the patients that uh, we have in that, 
in, in that study. But as you can see, we have other things as well. For instance, we have uh, cryptorchidism that is affecting the testicular size and also the testicular sperm production. We have genetic conditions. We have testicular failure. And we have idiopathic conditions that respond for at least 10, 15% of cause of male infertility. All these things are important for you to know because during the standardization of male infertility, we will need to go through these things and then discuss them in more detail. So uh, one question you might ask is this one. Why bother about male infertility in the ICSI area? Well, we have ICSI in our hands and ICSI is widespread across the globe. There are more than 2 million babies born from assisted reproductive technology and there is a uh, remarkable increase in use of ICSI in the last 20 years. For instance, in some parts of the world, including Asia, India, uh, also Latin America, the, 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 the place we are located here, you can see that use of ICSI is quite big. If you consider assisted reproductive technology as a whole, conventional IVF and ICSI combined, in LATAM, for instance, 85% of the ART cases we perform nowadays are actually ICSI cases. In Asia, about 55%. I, I would like to hear more about India because Asia is obviously also including China and in China they do a lot of conventional IVF. But the issue is we have this opportunity to treat our male infertility patients with ICSI, which is a revolutionary treatment and has been one of the most significant advancements in the treatment of male infertility because it made patients who are oligospermic, azospermic due to obstructive azospermia or non-obstructive azospermia able to have biological offspring, which was not possible before ICSI due to the limitations of conventional IVF. And moreover, the early X experience uh, suggested that having sperm, any number will be enough for X to work. So then we have a patient with male infertility that we can treat with ICSI and we could solve the problem without going through all these discussions that we will have through these webinars. The problem with that is that even with ICSI, this fantastic treatment, the pregnancy rates are not over 50%. We know that it is related to female age, but when the ICSI experience actually expanded, more and more studies started to show that sperm parameters might influence ICSI outcomes. Sperm concentration in the extreme levels like cryptozoospermia when the sperm count is very low, sperm motility when it's very low as well, sperm morphology, and more important, later on, we have seen that the quality of sperm we put into the egg makes a difference, especially related to sperm chromatin damage. So the DNA content of sperm actually used for ICSI we will make a major impact on ICSI outcomes. So the bottom line is that we have this technology, which is good, but it's not only related to female age, the success we will obtain from ICSI, but also from male conditions. The other issue that is important for us to consider that if we do not pay attention to male infertility, we might lose several patients coming to our clinics because male infertility increase the risk of patient dropout from IVF treatment. The male patient, sometimes they are not expressing the fear and the negative feelings about the treatment. They might have problems, communication problems with the partner, and they might feel that they are the cause of infertility and the reason why the couple is not having a baby. So we need to pay attention in that 
because even when we go for ICSI treatment using sperm from patient with male infertility, there are certain health issues that are potentially related to the male subfertility, including increased risk of congenital malformations, increased risk of cancer in the child uh, being born from ICSI, also psychological and neurological development might be affected by the male infertility condition, the cardiometabolic profile. Well, ICSI is a fantastic uh, way to treat our infertile couples, but there's a risk. And anytime we can improve the quality of sperm, we might be able to provide an opportunity for these couples to have a healthy baby. In this study that I'm sharing with you, we did a, a very, let's say, comprehensive systematic review of all the consequences to offspring related to use of ICSI, specifically in the case of male infertility. It was published uh, recently in Nature Reviews Urology, and this is something for us to be concerned. So what do we need to do? And then going back to the question I made to you before, why bother about male infertility in the X area? Well, it's very simple. Male infertility is associated with impaired overall health, decreased life expectancy in lower quality of life. There is reduced fecundability. There's longer time to pregnancy. And there is increased risk of recurrent pregnancy loss in couples facing infertility where the male partner is involved as cause of that difficulty. Male infertility is associated with a negative effect on reproductive outcomes. And in this scenario, we can talk about intrauterine insemination and also ART, including both conventional IVF and ICSI. And also there's a risk, potential risk, transfer of ge sperm genetic defects when we use IVF and ICSI, which might potentially affect the health of resulting offspring. So as you can see, there are several reasons why we should pay attention about male infertility. And in this condition, the scope of male infertility is broad and includes conventional and let's say more advanced diagnostic methods hormonal control, genetic and epigenetic regulation, interventional therapy, and also obviously assisted reproductive technology. So all healthcare providers involved in the management of infertile couples, including the infertility consultants, the reproductive endocrinologists, urologists, andrologists, gynecologists, embryologists, nurses, everyone should actually pay attention on the male side because the diagnosis and treatment will have a positive effect on overall health and will have a positive effect as well in the art outcomes. So if I can make sperm better, I might be able to actually improve the results I have in my clinic. That will make a difference for the couple coming to see us. Well, after this brief introduction about the importance of male infertility, I want to move to my next uh, point, which will be the standardization of male infertility workup. So let's consider now a case study. And this case study is very simple, but this reflects the patients that come to us all the time. I have patients present with this scenario uh, every day in my clinic. And when I finish this presentation, I will have some of them for sure presenting something like that. They come to the office, with a infertility complaint of some year's duration. In this case, it's five year duration. You, uh, we have a, a female partner who is Elmenoreik. She's 31 years old. And the partner, the male partner is 35. And apparently he's healthy. So he's bringing to me two semen analysis done somewhere else, uh, which shows that this ejaculate volume is normal, let's say 2.5 ml, 3.2 ml in the second semen analysis. The sperm count 
is like 12 million in the first one, 15 million in the second one. Progressive motility ranging from 32 to 35%, and morphology ranging for, from 4% to 5%. So this is very common scenario that presents in front of us. And then you need to ask, how shall I approach this condition? And what shall I do in terms of the investigation? What is important for me to consider? Well, we published a study a few years ago that I shared with this literature with you, which was an update on the clinical assessment of the infernal male. And then I will use most of the information from this particular paper that that I recommend you to read and have printed in your office because it will be, let's say, a, a useful, let's say, a resource for you to consider when handling your male infertility patients. So uh, in very simplistic way, we need to consider, first of all, the clinical history, the physical examination, and the semen analysis. Based on these conditions, Will you then decide what to do next? If you will be able to kind of uh, confirm the diagnosis and then prepare a treatment plan, or you you need other tests that might be useful for actually to evaluate the patient better. In some case, based on the clinical history, physical examination, and the semen analysis, we will need sperm functional tests endocrine evaluation and additional testing that might be, for instance, genetic evaluation, the ultrasound, the uh, testicular biopsy and so on. And I will go through these steps with you now. So the first thing to consider is that you need to have a plan in terms of the male infertility history. You need to ask several important questions. First of all, you need to go through the history of infertility the age of the partners, length of, of time the couple has been uh, trying to conceive, if there's any contraceptive methods and duration, if there were previous pregnancies, previous treatment, or any other treatments related to the female partner that you might well actually go through, this is part of your investigation, but see the, the, the couple as a whole and try to identify if there's any problems in the sexual history, for instance, from the male perspective. For instance, libido, is, is it good? Uh, are the patients using any lubricants to have intercourse? You know, the lubricants might affect sperm motility, especially these lubricants. Uh, usually they have some chemicals uh, that will affect sperm motility. So they need to avoid as much as possible use of lubricants when they are trying to conceive, any lubricants. Uh, although there are some lubricants that might be used because they are claimed as non-toxic, we need to be very careful when we actually uh, recommend lubric lubricants for the couple. We never do it here. I ask my patients to avoid lubricants when they are trying to conceive. So the other issue is obviously the frequency of having intercourse. Usually the sperm actually will, the patient will make new sperm every like, three months, but the sperm production is continuous. And every three days, two, three days, the reservoir, the epididymis will be full, let's say. So if the patient is having intercourse every two or three days, it's quite good if it's having every four days, five days. But more than that, actually, it might be not ideal because when you have storage of sperm for long periods of time in the epididymis, it started to affect not only sperm motility, but also the sperm chromatin integrity, which is also important for, for the ability of uh, the patient to impregnate his wife. All the important things to ask is a childhood, childhood conditions like cryptorchidism, uh, testicular trauma, infection like mumps or chitis, testicular torsion, problems with sexual development, puberty onset. Was it too early? Was it too late? 
any use of medication. So personal history, including systemic diseases, previous uh, sexually transmitted diseases. This is very important because this might affect the epididymis and making actually a problem for sperm transit and sperm quality. Any previous surgeries you need to ask, such as previous orchidopexy for a patient with cryptorchidism, for instance, which age, herniorrhaphy uh, or chiectomy, any other surgery, inguinal, scrotal, perineal, bariatric surgery that might affect sperm count, any surgery affecting the testicle or the bladder or the prostate you need to ask for. Another important thing to consider is if the patient has been exposed to uh, any gonadotoxin medication, like uh, any drug, uh, including uh, heavy consumption of alcohol, smoking, use of medication. There are some medications that might affect fertility, such as antihypertensive medication, some antibiotics like sulfasalazine, nitrofurantoin, uh, calcium blockers, which is a very effective drug as antihypertensive, but might affect the ability for sperm to undergo the acrosome reaction and be able to fertilize the oocyte. Finasteride, several patients are using finasteride for hair loss. This uh, medication will actually improve, let's say, the condition in terms of a, uh, uh, decreasing the, 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 the way the patient is having this uh, hair problem, but it will also affect the important aspect of testosterone production, which will, at the end of the day, affect sperm count. Another important issue to consider is the exposure of organic uh, uh, solvents in the workspace, heavy metals. If the patient has used anabolic esteroids for uh, body building, several of these patients might be using anabolic asteroids that will affect sperm production. And the bad news is that for, let's say, 10% of patients using anabolic asteroids for a long period of time, the effect is irreversible. So they will not be able to go back to the baseline sperm count and quality after stopping anabolic asteroids. So we need to kind of gather information about this as I said, tobacco use, if the patient is exposed to high temperatures in the workplace, electromagnetic energy, radiation, etc. So another important thing to consider is the family history of infertility, if uh, the, the brothers and sisters and the relatives, any condition of, of infertility previously reported by the family, and if the patient has any issues that might indicate a problem of endocrine problem like uh, anosmia, which might be related to hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, galactorrhea, which might be related to hyperprolactinemia, obesity, as I said, because obesity will actually decrease sperm production uh, due to the effect of obesity in the hypo hypothalamic uh, hypogonadal axis and also the direct effect of obesity in the testicle. I will go through later on. Well, this, as you can see, are several things that you need to dedicate some time during the history to kind of gather information about. So you can have this, let's say, outline of these eight items that I just described to you and go through them very quickly during the consultation to gather information about that. So the second thing we need to do is the physical examination. And in that regard, we need to, first of all, look at virilization, how well the patient is virilized. So this appropriate sexual development you need to address. And then uh, you need to look at the body hair distribution. If the patient has gynecomastia or any eunuchoid proportions that might actually indicate 
some androgen deficiency. The other thing you need to do is look at the inguinal and genital areas that may reveal scars from previous surgical interventions, such as hydrocele or uh, inguinal hernia repair, which might account to damage to the vas deferens and also the testicular blood supply. So this is something that you need to pay attention on. And then we go for the one of the most important things, which is the physical examination of the testes, which is related to the ability that you have for sperm production. So it's important for you to consider that the normal adult testicles should have a four centimeter length and a 2.5 centimeter width, resulting in a volume of approximately 18 to 20 ml. Well, I like to use the Prader orchidometer that you can see in this slide because this is very easy way to have in the office because the Prader orchidometer, as you can see, it's a plastic device. It comes with uh, this, uh, let's say these modules, different testicular size, starting from 20 ml, uh, going down to 2 ml. So you can compare during the physical examination the size of the testicle using the Prader orthodontometer with the uh, actually the volume of the testicles of the individual patient, and then you record that information in the consultation. So it's important for you to remember that the testicles should be firm in consistency because 85% of what we have in the testicle is actually the testicular parenchyma responsible for spermatogenesis. 85%. 15% relates to Leibig cells, in interstitial cells, actually responsible for testosterone production. However, there is no lower limit for testicular volume to exclude presence of sperm. If you have a patient in front of you with azospermia, and then you bring the Prader orchidometer to uh, estimate the testicular volume and you realize that the volume is like, for instance, 6 cc and then you automatically uh, decide that the patient with 6 cc and azospermia will not be able to have sperm using sperm retrieval technique. This is a mistake because even in his very small testicles like ones of Kleinfelter syndrome patients in which the testicles sometimes are like 4 cc, 3 cc, uh, we will be able to find sperm in some cases. So you cannot exclude the opportunity for the patient to move forward because of the testicular size alone. But it's important to kind of evaluate the size of the testicle but it, because we will really reflect how good or bad the situation is. The second point during the physical examination when you are examining the testicle is actually looking at the epididymis and the vas deferens because these are also important after sperm being produced inside the testicle, it will go through the epididymis for maturation and then the vas deferens. The epididymis should be evaluated according to size and consistency. A healthy epididymis is firm, but when I see an obstructed epididymis, it's usually enlarged and ingurgitated. So this condition can be related to some sort of obstruction caused by infection. It could be genetic condition such as CBAVD, which is an acronym for congenital absence of the vas deferens, or could be related to vasectomy, which is very common in our, in our uh, country uh, here in Brazil. So these conditions might cause obstruction. Uh, and then when you examine the epididymis, it will be like uh, ingurgitated. The vas deferens, you should also be able to feel the vas uh, within the spermatic cord as a distinct firm round, like a spaghetti-like structure. So you feel the vas because if you are not feeling the vas, the patient might have congenital absence of, of the vas deferences. Or you might have a vas which is not uh, so, uh, let's say, homogeneous. 
you might see some narrow areas when you kind of palpate the vest that might be uh, caused by infection or some previous surgeries like hernia repair. So have a look at the vest, have a look at the testicle, and then we need to look uh, at the spermatic cord because this is the method of choice for the diagnosis of varicose, which is very important in terms of male infertility. To look at the spermatic cord, we need to put the patient in a standing uh, position like I'm showing in this picture. Uh, it should, the, the room should not be very cold. So don't examine your patients with the air condition like 19 degrees. It should be like room temperature between 22 and 27 degrees. Uh, and then you need to kind of look at if you can see vessels, dilated vessels, or you can feel these vessels, which represent the varicose. Varicose is a common condition among men facing infertility, as I showed you before in the distribution uh, chart that I presented in previous slide, it was like uh, uh, up to 15, 20% of the male patients we see. Uh, what we see in this picture is a patient with large varicose. You see large varicose, it's grade three. You just put the patient standing up and then you will be able to actually see those dilated veins. This is a grade three large varicose. In this case, the veins are visible through the scrotal screen, skin at rest. When you cannot see, for instance, those veins as shown in the picture, and then you need to kind of do the physical examination, feel the spermatic cord, and then if you can palpate the veins at rest, they are not visible, but you can palpate. And then in this condition, we have grade two or moderate varicose. And the third one is grade one, small varicose. These veins are not visible or palpable at rest, but when the patient make Valsalva maneuver, increasing the abdominal pressure, and then you can feel that the veins are actually getting enlarged. So this is important part of the physical examination that you kind of feel the spermatic cord with the patient standing up to kind of evaluate if there's any varicose that might affect testicle. What you can also do if you don't have experience doing the physical examination, you might use the color Doppler ultrasound to confirm the presence of the varicose. But one important thing to do if you order the ultrasound is to ask the radiologist to make the examination with and without the Valsalva maneuver and with the patient standing up. Because if the patient is just lying, the, the uh, ultrasound might not be able to identify small varicose that still might affect sperm production and sperm quality. So it's important that you instruct the radiologist providing services to you that the colodoppler ultrasonography for a patient for a male infertility patient should be done to evaluate the testicle, the spermatic cord in which the patient should be standing up, and then with and without Valsalva maneuver. In my center, what I like to use is the nine megahertz Doppler probe ultrasound, as you can see in this picture because in my office, I can just ask the patient to do the Valsalva maneuver and I will be able to hear the reflux of blood when the patient make the Valsalva, increasing the abdominal pressure, and then I will identify easily the small varicoceles that are not so straightforward, especially for non-experienced uh, examiners. So using the physical examination, and then you can take advantage of the 9 megahertz Doppler probe or even the color Doppler ultrasound, you will be able to identify the most important varicose cells that needs to be assessed. 
Why is it important to assess varicocele? Well, because varicocele is uh, associated with oxidative stress, uh, problems with uh, endocrine um, uh, profile, testicular hypoxia, sperm DNA fragmentation. So varicocele is very important because it could impair spermatogenesis, it might increase reactive oxygen species, it will increase problems in sperm, including sperm DNA fragmentation or sperm chromatin damage, if you like, that will decrease the male reproductive potential. So varicocele is something that we pay a lot of attention in our center for our male infertility patients. Well, uh, the semen analysis is also a cornerstone of the male infertility evaluation. It will provide information about the status of the spermatogenesis, the epididymitis, and the accessory sexual glands. And it will provide you with some information about the prognosis of the infertility. But remember, semen analysis is not a sperm functional test. It has several limitations. But if you need to take advantage of the semen analysis, it, to, it has to be done properly. And it has to be evaluated according to the WHO laboratory manual for the examination and processing of human semen. So the WHO uh, periodically releases manual, manuals uh, to kind of uh, teach people how to do the semen analysis. The last manual was released in 2010, and the manual provided not only the reference values for the semen analysis, but also the, uh, let's say, the procedures and the protocols to implement in the Andrology Lab or the IVF Center willing to do semen analysis on how the semen analysis has to be performed. These manuals can be downloaded for free from the WHO website, and then you can actually use these manuals to kind of improve the way you do the semen analysis. Well, what we uh, what you see in this slide is like the WHO criteria according to 2010 reference values, and then you have for volume count, sperm count total, motility, progressive motility, vitality morphology, this is a strict morphology that was uh, adopted by the 2010, this is the Kruger morphology now, and the number of leukocytes. These numbers represent, let's say, the minimum standards that you need to kind of check if your patients are, are uh, actually having when you order the semen analysis. In order for the semen analysis to represent uh, the fertility potential, it's important that it is done in a good andrology laboratory, uh, ideally with some external quality control. It should be a certified lab. And then you will take more advantage of the semen analysis. In our condition, for instance, in, at Androfer, we have a dedicated andrology laboratory, which is ISO 9001 certified with external quality control proficiency testing that is providing not only semen analysis, but also sperm function testing and sperm cryopreservation. preservation. This is something important that I consider uh, to kind of have as a uh, way to properly perform the semen analysis. Another important thing for you to consider is that when the WHO uh, evaluated and provided the, the reference values for the semen analysis, it used information from about 2,000 semen specimens from recent fathers with a time to pregnancy of less than one year. So what they did, they collect this information and they plot the results in a graph like that in which they look at the 5 percentile, the 50 percentile, and the 95 percentile uh, concerning the sperm parameters of that particular population. And arbitrarily, they decided to use the fifth percentile shown in this slide as the way to kind of analyze the lower limits of the semen analysis. 
However, it's important to consider that these uh, parameters were taken mostly from men coming from Europe, the United States, and Australia. None of uh, studies coming from India, China, Africa, Brazil, big countries with big population of patients facing infertility were taken into account for providing the reference values for the semen analysis. So we don't know for sure if these values actually represent the population we treat or see in our clinics. Although it can provide some guidance, we need to kind of be cautious when interpreting the semen analysis results because it might not reflect our population due to ethnic differences and etc. But I do consider the 50 percentile as a guidance. And the other thing that I like to do is to compare the 50 percentile with the 50 percentile, the 50 percent that you see in the middle of the graph, because this is where most patients who were considered fertile according to the WHO actually fit in. So when you look at the semen analysis report, and in this study, we provided a template how we should interpret the semen analysis. As you can see in our report at Androfer, we provide the patient results and then you can compare the patient results with a chart that we provide as well in the report in which you can see the lower limit, the 50 percentile, but you can also see the 50 percentile because then you can evaluate where the patient fit. You can plot the patient results according to the five and 50 percentile and see how close the patient is or outside if it's below the 50 percentile for you to discuss with the patient that although sometimes the patient is within the normal range it's a little bit higher than the 50 percentile it's very close to the lower limit so you need to take that into consideration because if you have a lady the partner she might be not so young or having some abnormalities from her side as well that the combination will not be good in terms of fertility so do not only look at the numbers and the 50 percentile but try to make a critical appraisal of the results you have in front of you and also consider that only one percent of sperm even reach the oocyte in vivo. So when you, we go for the semen analysis, which is actually looking at a, a widely ranging gross parameters of the whole ejaculate, it will not provide a very strong discriminatory information. It's impossible. So we need to kind of make a critical evaluation of the semen analysis and not take more than it should bring to us. Because in certain conditions, we need to take advantage of the sperm functional test, test that might be used to actually appreciate the DNA quality. In our center, we pay a lot of attention on oxidative stress and in particular sperm DNA fragmentation because several conditions affecting the male reproductive potential, including varicocele, infection, lifestyle, use of drugs, gonadotoxin, smoking, pollution, radiation, cancer, diabetes, systemic infections, all these conditions are related to excessive oxidative stress that might, at the end of the day, increase the risk of sperm DNA fragmentation. Sperm DNA fragmentation has been associated with infertility, uh, impaired reproductive outcomes after IUI, IVF, and ICSI, and increased risk for genetic birth defects, recurrent uh, miscarriage. So if you evaluate sperm DNA fragmentation during the semen analysis, you might be able eventually to provide some opportunities to treat the condition, the underlying condition, associated with sperm DNA fragmentation. And then you might be able to kind of 
improve the reproductive outcomes. We will go through this sperm DNA fragmentation in more detail in the next uh, webinar, but today I just want to kind of share some basic information about it. It's important to look at sperm DNA fragmentation because in some patients uh, with perfectly normal semen parameters according to the WHO, with no abnormalities in physical exam or history, these patients might have high sperm DNA fragmentation. In our condition here, we look at these patients with, let's say, apparently normal, they are having unexplained infertility. In 70% of our patient population fitting in the unexplained infertility scenario, we find sperm DNA fragmentation equal or higher than 30%. That might be the cause of infertility. So having a perfectly normal semen analysis according to the WHO does not exclude the possibility of the patient having high DFI that might compromise results. Uh, and the DFI is actually a condition, the sperm DNA fragmentation testing that we uh, order quite often in our center. In this study, we provided the clinical utility of sperm DNA fragmentation testing. We made practice recommendations based on clinical scenario. This is like a guideline that uh, you might use to kind of look at the conditions you need to order for sperm DNA fragmentation testing. We, for instance, clinical varicose seal, when the semen analysis is not so much affected and you are in doubt if the patient will benefit or not of varicose seal repair, you might take advantage of the sperm DNA fragmentation results because if, it's, if it were abnormal, then you would better put the patient on surgery before doing anything else, including ART, because it might help increase the success of your treatment. If the patient's having unexplained infertility, IUI failure for no apparent reason, or recurrent pregnancy loss, you might also actually uh, consider ordering sperm DNA fragmentation testing because unexplained infertility, IUI failure, and recurrent pregnancy loss might be associated with high DNA damage. The same apply when we look at conventional IVF and ICSI failure. If you have no apparent reason for having ICSI failure, IVF failure, with good embryos putting back to the uterus, consider that perhaps the reason for failure might be associated with high DFI. And the last condition is when I have patients with risk factor for oxidative stress, like obese men, uh, men uh, using some medication, uh, uh, cigarette uh, smokers that are reluctant to change their lifestyle. And then when you order the sperm DNA fragmentation testing and you show the patient that it's high, and it might affect the success of the treatment or even might increase the risk of transmitting genetic condition to the offspring, these patients will be more prone to change the lifestyle and you'll be able actually to have a better results in their treatment. We look at uh, how often we see high DNA fragmentation in our patient population so in this study in which we look at more than 1,500 infertile men attending Androfer, you see that uh, approximately 50% of patients will have DFI higher than 20%, and you have approximately 25% of these patients having DFI higher than 30%. So normal levels, according to the sperm chromatin dispersion test that you can see in the picture, this is the HALO test, that can be done using optical microscopy or fluorescence microscopy. This is the test we do nowadays in our center. The normal values should be below 20%. 20% and higher is something that you need to consider as potentially affecting the reproductive potential of that particular couple, especially when the DFI is higher than 30%. Well, this is important because when you have 
uh, evaluated sperm DNA fragmentation and in front of abnormal results, you need to look at, based on the history, physical examination, if there's any underlying factor that might be associated with the sperm DNA fragmentation. And then you might discuss with the patient to kind of avoid the factors promoting oxidative stress. You might start the oral antioxidant therapy. You might treat the condition that is causing uh, uh, oxidative stress, like the varicocele, like the infection, or controlling diabetes, metabolic syndrome, treating thyroid disorders, hyperprolactinemia. There are some studies also indicating that using follicle stimulating hormone therapy might help decrease sperm DNA fragmentation. And then you go for the assisted reproductive technology and there's some studies indicating that the use of testicular sperm in preference over the ejaculated sperm for men with high DFI might improve reproductive success when the couple is undergoing ICSI. We will go through sperm DNA fragmentation in more detail in the next webinar, but here I want just to show you some practical information about it that you need to consider during the male infertility investigation. The endocrine evaluation is also important. And in that regard, I want to show you some indications for the endocrine evaluation that you need to keep in mind Every time you see a patient in which the sperm concentration is below 10 million per ml, there is any complaint of erectile dysfunction, hypospermia, which is a ejaculate volume of less than 1 ml. Uh, if there is history or the patient is complaining of, of any endocrinopathies, or you see during the physical examination that the Tesco has uh, reduced its size, you need to kind of order the endocrine evaluation. So how we should do that? Well, just remember that the control of spermatogenesis is based on the FSH and LH. So the FSH, which is released by the anterior pituitary, will go through the blood, uh, the, the blood till it reaches the testicle and it will actually reach the Sertoli cells. Sertoli cells is like the nursery for the spermatogonias to kind of differentiate up to the sperm. So it's very important that we have FSH because FSH is like modulates spermatogenesis. Depending on the FSH levels, we have, let's say, an indication of the testicle is having difficulties to make sperm when the FSH goes up. And when FSH is very low, below certain threshold that I will explain to you in a minute, then there is no enough FSH to promote sperm production. This FSH is very important. The other way to look at the spermatogenesis is going to the other uh, compartment, which relates to the Leydig cells. The Leydig cells, as you know, uh, they make testosterone, androgens. So testosterone is extremely important for spermatogenesis, but not the testosterone that the patient take from outside, like using exogenous testosterone replacement therapy. No, this is very bad. The testosterone that is good is the intratesticular testosterone, the one made inside the testicle. This one is very important. So it is dependent on proper secretion of LH. So if you want to consider in a very simple way how the, let's say, the pituitary and the Sertoli cells and the Leydig cells are working and you don't have a lot of, let's say, resources to kind of go through a very comprehensive endocrine evaluation, the thing we need to do is look at testosterone values and FSH values. In this chart, you see that the threshold for testosterone will be 10.4 nanomoles per liter if you use that unit or 300 nanograms per deciliter in case you use nanograms per deciliter as the measurement unit. So this is the threshold. Below that, we say the patient has hypogonadism. So then the normal range will go up to 
27.7 nanomoles per liter or 800 nanograms per deciliter. So this is the normal range. Keep that chart in front of you. If the patient's having more than 800, most probably this patient is having some testosterone replacement therapy, which is very bad because testosterone replacement therapy using any sort of exogenous testosterone will inhibit the pituitary causing a uh, stop in sperm production. So keep that in mind. It should be in the green line, uh, in the green bar as shown in this, in this, in this graph. The other important thing about uh, testosterone is that, that when you have then low testosterone, hypogonadism, what I do, I then repeat testosterone just to make sure that there is no problem with the measurement. So I want to make sure that testosterone is really low. And then I add other things. And then I measure free testosterone, SHBG. This is also important because overweight and obese patients, they tend to kind of having more SHBG, which will kind of stick to the testosterone, make the free testosterone lower. You need to look at that. You need to also measure the LH in that condition to make sure that LH levels are within the normal range. So the Leydig cells are being stimulated properly. Then you need to measure the estradiol levels because when the patient has conversion of testosterone to estradiol by aromatase in the fat tissue, the testosterone could go down and then you need to see if the estradiol is too high. You need to measure prolactin because hyperprolactinemia might also cause hypogonadism. And you need to measure the thyroid hormones because hypothyroidism may also cause uh, hypogonadism. Uh, concerning FSH, when you have low testosterone and then you have low FSH, and the FSH is below 1.5 international units per liter, and then in that condition, the patient might have hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. So the combination of low FSH, below 1.5, low LH, below 1.5, and also low testosterone makes the diagnosis of hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. And this condition is easily treated by providing the patient FSH and H or HCG together to kind of increase the sperm production. So other causes of low FSH, what could be? It could be that the patient is taking testosterone replacement therapy. Every time the patient is taking testosterone exogenously, it will inhibit the pituitary and the FSH levels will go down. It could be done when the patient takes testosterone or when the patient is having HCG therapy. So this is our conditions associated with low FSH levels. So the normal levels are shown in the picture. It's between 1.5 and 7.6 international units per liter. And the high FSH levels starts from 7.6 international units per liter. Well, sometimes you see a report showing that the normal range of FSH goes from one until 13. Well, forget about it, because every time you have FSH levels higher than 7.6, it shows you that the patient is having some sort of spermatogenic dysfunction. Something's wrong with the testicle, and then the pituitary needs to release more FSH to compensate for that problem. So keep that in mind, uh, and do not look at let's say FSH as 10, as normal, because the report you have in front of you shows it is within the normal levels. Consider the 7.6 as the ceiling level for the FSH. So after doing the endocrine evaluation, you might need to look at other tests that might be useful for you to appreciate the male infertility condition. Then we need to discuss the genetic evaluation the scrotal ultrasound, testicular biopsy, I will go through 
these conditions now in the last, let's say, 15 minutes of this talk. Uh, but for concerning the genetic evaluation, I will discuss this in more detail with you in the next webinar. But for this uh, opportunity, I want just to uh, share with you some information related to the fact that male infertility can be associated with various genetic factors, including chromosomal aberrations, genetic mutations, and Y chromosome microdeletions. So these genetic abnormalities uh, are present in up to 15% of infertile men. And the frequency, as you can see in the graph, is inversely correlated with sperm count. The lower sperm count, the higher the frequency of chromosomal abnormalities affecting uh, the infertile men. So the genetic analysis, if you want to make it very simple for male infertility evaluation, we need to consider the karyotype and the Y chromosome microdeletion screening. The karyotype, uh, the chromosomal aber aberrations are, can be assessed through the karyotype and the PCR of the Y chromosome will be able to identify the Y chromosome microdeletions. So we can identify chromosomal aberrations like the Kleinfelter syndrome that you can see the report on the top uh, figure. It's a 47XXY. Or you can identify using PCR if there's any micro deletions affecting the Y chromosome, if there's any missing part affecting the AZF region of the long arm of the Y chromosome, which contains the most important genes for spermatogenesis. These are very, let's say, uh, straightforward evaluation that are done using the peripheral blood. And there are many laboratories actually providing these services across the globe. So you have plenty of them in India, I'm sure, that you can also actually take advantage of. It's important to do a genetic analysis because the karyotypic abnormalities are related to an uh, increased risk of miscarriages and also increased risk of, of having children with both chromosomal and congenital defects. The other important thing related to the genetic testing is that counseling. For instance, if you have a, a zoospermic patient with micro deletion affecting the Y chromosome and the patient has got sperm in sperm retrieval or even some sperm in the ejaculate that could be related, for instance, with deletions affecting the AZFC uh, region, well, and you do ICSI, and the couple actually have a baby, and the baby is a baby boy, the baby boy will inherite 100% the same condition from the father. So you are making a baby boy infertile, and this condition should be discussed with the patient because it's important for them to understand the implications of having a baby, or if they are planning to use any genetic, let's say, embryo biopsy uh, evaluation to kind of exclude the transfer of the affected embryo, uh, therefore decreasing the risk of having an affected child. In the paper that I shared with you in the beginning of my talk, that it's in the literature that I have shared with you, you will find the indications for genetic testing in male infertility. But basically, we need to consider a few conditions. If you have a patient with, in which the sperm count is below 10 million per ml and the patient's candidate for ART, you should ask for Y chromosome microdeletion screening and the karyotype, especially when the infertility is of unknown etiology. For patients with non-obstructive azospermia, considering the stickler sperm retrieval for XC, you should also ask for the karyotype and the Y chromosome microdeletion screening. These conditions, azospermia, we will discuss in the third webinar that we will have in a few weeks. The other condition that you need to consider in terms of genetic testing is 
gene mutation analysis concerning the cystic fibrosis gene, which is the CFTR gene. This is important for azospermic men with congenital absence of the vas deferens. So if you have a patient who has missing vas bilaterally, this patient has congenital bilateral absence of vas deferens. This is related to a genetic condition affecting most often the cystic fibrosis gene. So it's important to kind of check this mutation because some female partners could harbor some mutations as well that are asymptomatic in the female, but when combined two mutations, the baby could have cystic fibrosis, which is a lethal disease. So this is a condition we test for the CFTR gen mutation analysis, mostly related to, to CBAVD. CBAVD analysis, uh, C, uh, CFTR, uh, CFTR analysis uh, is also important when you have obstructive azospermia of unknown origin. There's no history of infection, but the patient is obstructive by the evaluation you do, physical examination, the test goals are normal, the endocrine profile is normal, perhaps you have a testicular biopsy showing that there's normal his, his, uh, spermatogenesis, and then in that case, the patient might have mutation affecting the CFTR gene that is important for you to look at. And when there's history of recurrent miscarriage or personal familiar history of genetic syndromes, it's important to ask for the cardiotype. So it's an outline of the indications for genetic testing that I find myself useful when looking and uh, doing the workup with my patients. So let's move now for another possibility, which is using the scrotal ultrasound during the male infertility evaluation. And here you can see the five conditions where you need to consider ordering the ultrasound. The scrotal ultrasound, when you have in the physical examination any palpable nodule or testicular mass, when the, you have done the physical examination concerning varicocele and results is equivocal. So, for instance, it might be because the patient is obese, it might be because the patient has got previous surgeries in which it's not so sure that the patient has the varicocele, and you might then take advantage of doing the scrotal ultrasound, as I mentioned before. If the patient has history of cryptorchidism, it's very important for you to order the ultrasound because a patient with cryptorchidism, there is increased risk of malignancy and you might be able to detect some small nodule inside the testicle. Also, patient with azospermia in particular, patients with idiopathic non-obstructive azospermia, you need to kind of consider that there's increased risk for malignancies in the testicles of patients with non-obstructive azospermia. And also severe oligosospermia with reduced testicular size, these patients also have increased risk of malignancies. One thing that is important for you to consider is that you see in the, in the bottom part of the slide, a testicle, a scrotal ultrasound showing, let's say, hyperechogenic, uh, let's say, uh, uh, calculi. This is microlithiasis that we can see in some patients. When you see that picture with several, let's say, echogenic uh, points like that, not one or two, but several, we call this condition microlithiasis. It has been reported that this condition is more common in patients with severe oligosospermia and non-obstructive azospermia. And there are some studies suggesting that it might increase the risk of carcinoma in situ. And then this condition, you need to keep the patient in, a, let's say, a regular follow-up analysis. So every year, the patient should have a ultrasound done to kind of check if there's no, let's say, nodule that might uh, appear 
in the follow-up studies that might indicate malignancy. So these are the five conditions that you need to consider when uh, looking at the ultrasound for patient with infertility. How about the transrectal ultrasound? Well, if you have a patient with low ejaculate volume and you are sure that there was no loss during collection, so there was, no, let's say, partial loss of the ejaculate volume during the semen analysis, so it's genuine low ejaculate volume below 1.5 ml. If the patient has any abnormal digital rectal examination, this is usually done by the urologist, or the patient is complaining of ejaculatory disorders such as an ejaculation or complete absence of ejaculation is called an ejaculation. If the patient has had any blood in the ejaculate, this is called high uh, hematospermia, or if the patient has any painful ejaculation, these are conditions you need to go and order transrectal ultrasound because the transrectal ultrasound will allow the evaluation of the distal extraductal system, the seminal vesicles and the ejaculatory ducts, which is very, will be very easy to appreciate using the, the ultrasound. For instance, what you can see in the top, in the, in the, in the top uh, right side of the slide is the ultrasound showing a cyst. You see a hypoechogenic uh, round, uh, let's say, uh, lesion in the midline of the prostate, exactly where the doctor was pointing out to you. Uh, this is a uh, midline cyst in the ejaculatory duct, causing obstruction. Well, it's possible to kind of do an operation called transrectal resection of the ejaculatory duct to remove the cyst, unroof the cyst. And the patient who was previously azospermic, he might be able to ejaculate sperm, normal, let's say, quantities of sperm. So the ejaculatory duct obstruction can be congenital or acquired due to, for instance, some sort of operation in the prostate. It could be complete, which is more common, and then it will cause complete azospermia, or the ejaculatory duct obstruction could be partial, causing severe oligozoospermia. So we might be able to identify the disorder using the transrectal ultrasound, because in that case, what we can see is the presence of uh, yeah, enlarged seminal vesicles, or we can see cysts in the, at the site of the ejaculatory ducts or the prostate. Also, when I have a patient with CBAVD, which is the congenital bilateral absence of the best deference, the transrectal ultrasound can help us to identify abnormalities in the seminal vesicles because usually when the vas is missing, the seminal vesicles is also missing because they share the same embryological, let's say, origin. So this is about the transrectal ultrasound. The last uh, um, imaging, uh, let's say, uh, opportunity I want to discuss with you is the, uh, res uh, the magnetic resonance, which is gaining increased popularity over the recent years. The magnetic resonance can also identify the ejaculatory duct obstruction, uh, like the transrectal ultrasound. We can appreciate the seminal vesicles when I have, let's say, absence of the vas deferences, I just confirm that the seminal vesicles are also absent, then making the diagnosis of CBAVD. If the patient has undescended tests, we will be able to identify in most occasions where the tests are located. And in case of hyperprolactinemia, we will be able to identify cranial, let's say, lesions affecting the pituitary, it could be uh, microadenoma, it could be a bigger, let's say, lesion causing uh, 
uh, hyperprolactinemia and also hypogonad hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. So when you have hyperprolactinemia, it's important to do magnetic resonance of the, the pituitary. So to go to my last point in terms of the male infertility evaluation, I will just briefly discuss with you the testicular biopsy, which is rarely indicated. Although several urologists, they like to kind of do the diagnostic testicular biopsy. Well, I can count uh, uh, the occasions I have used a uh, diagnostic testicular biopsy. We only use diagnostic testicular biopsy in selected case of azospermia or severe oligozospermia when I'm not sure the patient is having obstructive or non-obstructive azospermia. Well, using the clinical evaluation, I will show you in the third webinar about azospermia, it's not so difficult to distinguish patient with obstructive and non-obstructive azospermia. But if you have that question in your mind, you might use the testicular biopsy to kind of help you to discriminate between obstructive and non-obstructive. Most often, you will be able to do that only by the clinical examination and the endocrine profile and the history. But in very rare occasions, we might be able to use the testicular biopsy that can be done by open surgery as shown in this picture or percutaneous using testicular sperm expiration. If you, if you do testicular biopsy, it's important that the fixative that you use for sending the specimen to histopathology has to be the Bowens or Zenkers or glutaraldehyde solution because formalin uh, disrupts tissue architecture. So it's important to send the specimen to the pathologist in the proper condition. Otherwise you won't have, uh, let's say, adequate information. So when you do the, uh, the testicular biopsy, the results will come like uh, you may find that the patient has normal hispermatogenesis, as you can see in the picture, uh, indicating the normal hispermatogenesis cross-section of the seminiferous tubules in the left. Or you can have different uh, phenotypes like hypospermatogenesis, maturation arrest, or certainly cell only, which will represent cases in which the patient either have severe oligosospermia that is compatible with hypospermatogenesis, or the patient will have non-obstructive azospermia that could be associated with either hypospermatogenesis, maturation arrest, or certainly cell only. So you might come up with a diagnosis of a testicular biopsy showing normal spermatogenesis, which is indicative of obstruction, or you might end up with a report showing hypospermatogenesis in which the sperm production is there, is complete, but the layers from spermatogonia to spermatocytes to spermatids and to sperm, these layers of sperm production are decreased. So we call it hypospermatogenesis. It's a good prognosis for sperm retrieval. Then we, you have another condition called maturation arrest in which the spermatogenesis is arrested at some stage, could be at the spermatogony stage, spermatocyte or spermatid, or you can have a condition called Sertoli cell only in which you just have the Sertoli cells, but not actually the germ cells. Well, these three conditions can come combined in a testicular biopsy report, because in some case you might have the predominant pattern of Sertoli cell only and the advanced, let's say, area 
showing hypospermatogenesis, meaning that you might be able to retrieve sperm for ICSI. So the testicular biopsy, although it provides prognostic information concerning sperm retrieval, in particular men with non-obstructive azoospermia, uh, be cautious of doing testicular biopsy, because if you take the specimen out, that might be the last specimen containing sperm production. And then you just send it to the pathologist to provide you the result. And that specimen you should have sent to the embryology laboratory to do ICSI instead. So if you do a testicular biopsy, just make sure that you do in the IVF clinic, because then you can send the specimen to the embryology lab and the embryologists, they you split the sample in two. One specimen they send to the histopathologist, and the other one they look at it. And if they find sperm, they will be able to cryopreserve. So this is the this is the situation how we do the testicular biopsy at Underford. Well, to conclude, I'm just coming to the last part of my talk to the conclusions. Uh, I uh, wanted. Uh, in this talk to communicate to you that the evaluation of the male infertility patient goes far beyond a mere semen analysis. We need to pay attention in history, the physical examination, the semen analysis, including perhaps the sperm function test, in particular sperm DNA fragmentation testing, the endocrine profile, these are the minimum standards. And then you'll be able to use more additional tests like the ultrasound, like the uh, magnetic resonance, like the testicular biopsy, very rarely, uh, according to the situation you see in front of you. So, as conclusions, I want to leave some mes messages uh, with you. The first of all, the prevention and management of male infertility is an integral component of comprehensive sexual and reproductive health services needed to attain a sustainable development goal. Still, male infertility is under-recognized scientifically, epidemiologically, socially, psychologically, financially, and politically, but this landscape is changing because male infertility has been increasingly being accepted as a medical condition and a public health concern. So there's also growing evidence that male infertility is associated with impaired overall health, decreased life expectancy and lower quality of life. So a comprehensive evaluation of male infertility, as we have discussed in, during this webinar, has the potential to review serious and potentially life-threatening underlying medical conditions that could be treated and then increasing the overall health and also the diagnosis and treatment of male infertility will have a positive effect on the overall health of the patient. And most importantly, in the treatments we provide in our clinics for the male infertility patients. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank so you. now I will, be, I will be able to, I'm free now to interact with you. So if you have some questions, please do let me know. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, it's uh, for such a elaborate session on male, male evaluation. Uh, we'll be having certain questions. I'm asking the, uh, uh, those who are fellows or doctors who are uh, uh, having uh, viewing their this presentation on their laptop and uh, uh, mobile can put their question in the chat box. So I just want to ask you one thing: Have you been able to listen to the presentation completely, or you had any trouble uh, actually listening to me? No, sir. There was no. It was smooth going. There is no trouble at all. Thank it you very much. Uh, so, sir, we are having certain questions uh, coming up. Uh, one uh, first first question is from.
is from Vinod, uh, Dr. Vinod. Uh, he is asking, uh, what's the SO, what's your SOP you follow for erectile dysfunction, sir? Well, erectile dysfunction, in, in, in the sense of male infertility, it, it could cause, obviously, problems of intercourse and may affect the, the opportunity for the patient to, to conceive. Uh, most often, what we do in the erectile dysfunction scenario, we do the endocrine profile. Uh, we ask for the FSH uh, measurement. You need to ask for the testosterone, not only the total testosterone, but also the free testosterone in SHBG. Okay. And then you need to do the physical examination. You need to do, see the physical examination to see if the testicles are the testicular size because the hypogonadism, the low testosterone, the low testicular size might actually be a condition affecting the um, uh, erection. You need to uh, uh, also in the physical examination look at the penile uh, to see the penis, if there's any curvature like peroni disease that could affect intercourse. So basically you do uh, the same, let's say, uh, workflow that I presented to you. History, which is related to the use of any medication that could cause erectile dysfunction. For instance, high antihypertensives, usually they might be uh, causing some sort of problem. You need to see if the patient is actually obese or overweight and having low testosterone for you to provide some treatment. But remember, the if you see a patient complaining of erectile dysfunction in an infertility couple, it could be related to the psychological condition of infertility per se, rather than a anatomic or uh, hormonal problem actually affecting fertility. And remember, you should never prescribe testosterone for patient complaining of erectile dysfunction. Because if you give exogenous testosterone, the patient will have decreasing sperm production because you inhibit the pituitary when you give testosterone replacement therapy. Okay, thank you, sir. So one more question is there. Is there any role of uh, uh, sperm culture, sir? Well, sperm culture is very complicated because uh, there is contamination. I mean, when you uh, collect sperm for culture, uh, we have bacteria uh, living in the urethra. They colonize the urethra. And it's very common that you will find in the sperm culture more than one bacteria actually in the report. This is one problem that we see. And the, on the other hand, you might uh, face a negative sperm culture in a patient with some, let's say, uh, infection because the semen itself has antibacterial properties, especially zinc which is present in this ejaculate is antibacterial properties of zinc will, let's say, decrease the opportunity for some bacteria to grow. So I don't rely very much on semen culture anymore. What I do uh, concerning infection, I do during the semen analysis, I look at the number of leukocytes. So you do your semen analysis, you ask the laboratory also to provide you with the number of leukocytes. So usually the laboratory, they will provide the number of round cells that could be leukocytes or immature sperm. But then if they do a very simple test called peroxidase test, they will be able to differentiate the round cells that are leukocytes or uh, immature germ cells. So if you have more than 1 million leukocytes after the peroxidase test in the semen, I usually consider that the patient has infection, could be clinical if the patient is presenting some symptoms, or subclinical if it's, the patient has no symptom. And what I will do in that particular condition, I will treat my patient two weeks with doxy doxycycline 
100 milligrams twice a day and I treat the couple, both men, uh, both men and female using doxycycline, taking into consideration the leukocyte count. So the semen culture is very complicated to provide you meaningful results and we discontinued the use of, of semen culture in our, in our clinic. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, one more question is there. Uh, so once uh, uh, DNA fragmentation is done, uh, it's valid for how, uh, for what's duration? Well, uh, the DNA fragmentation is a test that is done like the semen analysis. So there are two important considerations for you to consider with the sperm DNA fragmentation. Is the ejaculatory abstinence, number one. Because the longer the abstinence, the higher the DNA fragmentation, the longer the sperm stays in the epididymis because of the oxidative stress actually going on in the epididymis, especially in, among infertile men, it will increase sperm DNA fragmentation. So first of all, you need to order the test with abstinence period, not longer than three days. We do sperm DNA fragmentation testing using abst ejaculatory abstinence from two to three three days. Well, the test is valid like the semen analysis. If there's any change in the condition, for instance, if you identify a high sperm DNA fragmentation and the patient was, was taking any medication, smoking or, or uh, obese, overweight, and then what you do is actually you provide some treatment to decrease weight or you stop, the patient stops smoking or you actually treat the varicocele, three months later, you should order the DFI again because you will appreciate a change and it will also affect the spermatogenesis. So the test is valid for, let's say, about three months as the semen analysis, but it could be valid even longer if anything else changed in that patient profile, and then you could consider the DFI results even longer than three months. So I see a question in front of me, what is the minimum uh, count cut off for semen freezing? Well, there is no minimum count cut off for semen freezing, because today we have some, uh, we have some devices in which we can freeze a small amount of sperm so there's uh, low volume carriers like the cell sleeper device. I will show this device during the webinar about azospermia in which even when you have, let's say, a dozen sperm only, provided the cells are viable, provide, provided you see some motility that you can even stimulate with pentoxifylin, you will be able to kind of pick up this uh, very few spermatozoa using the ICSI needle that you use for ICSI, and you load these very few cells in the cell slipper device, and then you can freeze. I mean, so obviously, uh, the uh, survival uh, rate of using uh, specimens with very poor quality will depend on the device you use for freezing. For instance, if you use the conventional freezing technique, the vapor, uh, the liquid nitrogen vapor uh, technique for freezing TZ or TZ specimens, the survival rate will be low, around 20%, because this is not the ideal method for freezing sperm for, for a patient with non-obstructive azospermia. However, when you use the cell sleeper device that uh, you, again, I will come back with this discussion later on, uh, you will see that the survival rate reaches 70, 70%. So, I mean, we can improve dramatically the survival rate of the semen specimens from patients with non-obstructive azospermia using the proper method. However, there's one condition. For instance, if you have a patient, if you have a TISA specimen or the TZ specimen from a patient 
uh, with azospermia. It's a good prognosis case in which you have quite good number of sperm. And then in that case, you don't need to use the low volume carrier to kind of increase the survivability of that specimen. You can still use the conventional freezing method and the survival rate will be around 50%, which means that because the number of cells you had before was, was good, you still had viable sperm for it. Okay, thank you, sir. One more question is there for you. Uh, Okay, I, I can see it. The question is about how long the antioxidant should be given when I have an uh, increased uh, DFI, uh, repeating a DFI after antioxidant therapy, or sperm sorting procedure. Well, this is a uh, this is a important question that needs some consideration. The first thing that you need to consider is that. Uh, antioxidant therapy might help uh, to decrease the DFI. However, the decrease in DFI is not so remarkable. So, for instance, the studies uh, have shown that the relative decrease in the DFI after antioxidant therapy is about 15% relative decrease, one five only. What does, what does it mean? So if I have a patient with a DFI of, DFI of 50%, 5-0, and I give antioxidants for three months, this is the, you should give at least for three months, because at giving three months, you will cover the spermatogenic cycle that will last for about three months. And then that patient that I mentioned, let's say for this example, 50% DFI, after the antioxidant therapy, the DFI will go down 15% relative decrease. So it means it will go down only 7.5 percentage points, still being above the cutoff point. So my practice is to give the antioxidant for two to three months at least. But I advise the patient that the sperm, uh, the, that we need to check again the DFI three months later. So I advise repeating the DFI to make sure that it's going down. And in that condition, the high DFI patient in our clinic, we, and we try to identify if there is any underlying factor that we could improve. It could be giving antioxidant, as I mentioned to you. It could be treating the varicocele. It could be asking the patient to stop smoking, stop the gonadotoxin ma uh, medicine, uh, lose some weight. It could be also using testicular sperm for ICSI in preference over ejaculated sperm. I will show in the next webinars that this, uh, the sperm uh, DFI in testicular sperm is lower than ejaculated sperm. And then you might be able to kind of improve the ICSI outcomes using testicular sperm. You can also use sperm sorting procedures, as you, as you mentioned in the in the in your question, like Max, for instance, which has been shown to decrease somehow the sperm DNA fragmentation. But you won't be able to completely uh, remove sperm with the DFI with any of these sperm sorting procedures, because the oxidative stress causing the DFI will occur during the epididymis passage most often. So you might be able to decrease the DFI, but not completely eliminate. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, a few more questions are there for you, sir. Yeah, okay. So I yeah. see a question here, how to collect sperm in case of retrograde ejaculation and unejaculation? Well, in the retrograde ejaculation, you need to uh, alkalinize the bladder, the urine. So what I do in that case, I ask the patient to, uh, you know, this culinary that we use for food, bicarbonate, the salt, bicarbonate salt, 
I ask the patient to use one uh, tablespoon of bicarbonate in a glass of water. The patient takes that three times a day for five days. And then the patient come to the clinic. He provides the masturbation. And then he will get the retrograde ejaculation. And after that, the patient will urine uh, provide urine to the laboratory and we will centrifuge and then we will process the specimen after this alkalinization. If the patient is able to provide, let's say, to have the, the, uh, the erection and masturbation. So if it's a spinal cord injury patient in which he's not been able to provide, let's say, the ejaculation by himself, in case of an ejaculation, as you mentioned that there, we use a penile vibratory uh, uh, vibrator, a penile vibrator, which is a device specifically designed to kind of provide the, uh, the reflex the, for ejaculation in patients in which the spine, spinal cord injury is above the level of T12. So if the patient has high uh, lesions, and then you'll be able to use the vibrator. If not, you need to use the uh, uh, rect uh, rectal uh, electroejaculation. So to answer your question, you need to do alkalinization of the urine, if possible, with the bicarbonate, and you collect the urine, you process the semen in the lab to see if you'll be able to do IUI, provide it, the uh, quality is good. So we test before, like a diagnostic, a retrograde ejaculation semen analysis to see if the patient will have enough sperm for IUI or IVF. If not, we prefer to take sperm from the testicle using testicular sperm aspiration and doing ICSI in that particular condition. Uh, so, any immune tests, uh, especially anti-sperm antigens? Uh... Well, in the past, yes, we used quite a lot the anti-sperm antibodies as, as a sperm functional test for male infertility. Now, these tests are, I mean, not used so often anymore. Uh, also, the manufacturers uh, providing these reagents are not actually very active in the field anymore. So it's not so easy to find, let's say, a manufacturer providing the kits for doing anti-sperm antibodies. So if you, if you do it, you, you need to do it in the semen only in cases that you suspect that there's some anti-immune problem. Let's say that the patient has got very uh, good sperm count and very poor motility, sperm motility, in which you see the shaking motility that might be suggestive of autoimmune uh, uh, immunity. And then you might order for anti sperm antibodies in the semen, not in the blood, because in the blood it doesn't provide any information. So you need to look at in the semen. If you have the opportunity to test for that, fine, because then in that case, you'll be able to kind of move the patient, provide, uh, perhaps from IUI or conventional IVF to ICSI directly, because it has been shown that for patients with autoimmune problems, anti-sperm antibody, antibodies, ICSI outcomes are much better than conventional IVF outcomes or IUI outcomes. So in that case, you just uh, decide what the proper method of fertilization to offer your patient. There is no treatment like uh, yeah, corticosteroids that have been used in the past. In the past, They are associated with uh, significant number of side effects and no one is using corticosteroids anymore for autoimmune infertility because you need to use for long periods of time and it will actually uh, bring important side effects to the patient. So we rarely use uh, sperm 
antibodies in our clinic. Most often we use this test in patients we did vasectomy reversal in which the motility is low after the operation and the sperm count is good. And I want to see if the uh, anti sperm antibodies are still there. But there is very little role for these tests in the nowadays. Okay, thank you. So one more question: What's the due dose and duration of vitamin C therapy, if at all we have to give? Yeah, okay. It it should it, it should be part of the antioxidant therapy. You need to give five hundred milligrams per day for two to three months, at least two to three months. But remember one thing. If you should split the dose of vitamin C, five milligrams twice or three times a day, because the vitamin C receptor saturate and the receptors in the body will not be able to absorb more than 180 milligrams every eight hour. So if you ask the patient to take five milligrams vitamin C at once, it means that the receptors will absorb 180 milligrams and will just throw the rest away. So it's very important to remember that you need to split. The other thing, you should never give more than 500 milligrams per day because higher dosages of vitamin C could be pro-oxidative and you might actually help the oxidative stress condition to be worse. So to answer your question, three months, maximum five milligrams is split twice or three times a day. So what should the duration of doxycycline, any role of metronidazole? The duration of doxycycline should be 15 days, two weeks, 100 milligrams twice a day. And uh, the role for metronidazole is only if you have some in, uh, some indication of a parasite in the in the in the semen. So, if you go for then the semen culture, and then you see that you identify any specific uh, microbial that is sensitive for the metronidazole and that condition specifically you might be able to use it but in that case you need to have indication of the specific agent is there so what i do overall i go for doxycycline when i have the leukocytospermia which is higher than 1 million uh, leukocytes per ml I give to the couple. Well, if after the treatment, I still I repeat the semen analysis and the leukocyte count two weeks after finishing the treatment. So I wait two weeks, two weeks, 15 days to repeat the semen analysis and leukocyte count. So if I still see that the leukocytes are, are high, and then in that particular condition, you can go for the semen culture to see if you will be able to identify any specific agent and in that condition you will treat the specific agent with the proper antibiotics keeping in mind that the semen culture has several limitations so there is something uh, about the management of globosperm yes sir total absolute glo glo globosperm you need to do sperm activation in uh, total globosospermia because there is no treatment. This is a genetic condition in which there is no treatment to overcome, let's say, the situation and make uh, the testicles produce better sperm. So the only thing you can do in that case, in the laboratory, you provide sperm activation. What we do in our center when we have 100% uh, globosospermia, we use pentoxifylin to increase the cyclic AMP you, we, uh, after sperm injection, you use calcium ionophore to oocyte activation. And we also use strontium after uh, the injection that will activate the oocyte as well. So 
you need to work with the uh, sperm uh, and oocyte activation protocol in the embryology laboratory to overcome globosospermia. So one more question is there, uh, which group of patient would benefit from low dose of aclomiphene or cilletrozole, uh, those male who are having infertility, male factor infertilities? There's very, uh, let's say, little room for clomiphene citrate in male infertility. A lot of doctors are using clomiphene citrate or even letrozole for, let's say, idiopathic oligozospermia. Uh, with, with the intention to increase the semen count, but the studies show that there is no actually effect in the likelihood of pregnancy when you do empirical treatment with clomiphene or letrozole, with some exceptions. If I have a patient with hypogonadism, which means the testosterone is low, below 300 nanograms per deciliter or 10.4, or 10.4 nanomoles per liter, in that particular condition, if you want to increase the testosterone, endogenous levels of testosterone, and remember, intratesticular testosterone is important for spermatogenesis, you might use clomiphene citrate or letrozole in small dosages. So in that condition, when you give these drugs, the pituitary will release more FSH and more LH, and then you might have more testosterone being produced by the testicle. And in some cases, you might see an increase in sperm count. But remember, you need to measure the testosterone levels two weeks after starting clomiphene or letrozole, because in some patients, the testosterone levels will go too high and you will surpass the ceiling level that I presented in my talk. And when the testosterone levels goes very high, which happens in about 30% of patients being treated with clomiphene citrate or letrozole. So these patients, they will have actually worsening in their sperm count and sperm quality rather than getting better. So I rarely use clomiphene citrate in my practice. When I have a patient with hypogonadism, I prefer to give HCG therapy, and then I will discuss more about that in the next uh, webinars. But if the patient uh, cannot afford the HCG therapy and the patient has hypogonadism, low sperm count, you might give the patient clomiphene every other day 25 milligrams every other day, not more than that. So you need to split the pill in two because usually these pills come in 50 milligrams presentation. So you split the pill, ask the patient to split the pill in two and give 25 milligrams every other day. And then test again, measure testosterone to see if you are actually providing any help. So there's a yeah, there's a question here about decreased motility in the presence of normal count and morphology and management. Well, uh, isolated uh, low motility can happen in situations, for instance, in which the abstinence period, you ask the patient to provide the sperm uh, the sperm for analysis is too long. So remember that every time you actually increase the ejaculatory abstinence of more than five days, the motility will go down. So the semen analysis should be done with abstinence period from two to seven days according to the WHO. But in our center, we are always ask the patient to provide semen using abstinence period from two to three days, not more than that. So it means if you exclude the problem of, let's say, long 
ejaculatory abstinence period, and the patient has this condition that you, you are presenting in the, in the question, which is not common, because usually when we have decreased motility, it comes with something else. It comes with some problems related to count or morphology. You, you need to consider, first of all, varicocele, because varicocele has been associated with decreased motility. You need to uh, also consider infection, some sort of infection. Uh, increased leukocyte number could be related also to decreased motility. In that particular condition, if there's a varicocele, you might need to discuss with the patient varicoselectomy. And if there is leukocytospermia, you will treat the couple using doxycycline, as I, as I uh, explained before. And these are actually the situations you see. In certain circumstances, you may see decreased motility when the patient has antisperm antibodies, as I mentioned before. And if there's any, uh, let's say, uh, suspicion of antisperm antibodies in a patient with infection or a, a disruption of the testicular blood barrier because the patient has got testicular biopsy, for instance, and you might actually, in that case, uh, if there's an opportunity to check for the antisperm antibodies in the semen, you might be able to identify that the decreased motility is related to sperm antibodies. If there's no, nothing else you can do to, if there's no infection, for instance, there's no varicocele and there is antisperm antibodies, the management will be to put the patient on ICSI treatment rather than IVF or IUI. Okay, sir. Uh, so testicular versus ejaculated sample in Cartagena syndromes. Which to be well, which are, Yeah, okay. Cartagena syndrome is a genetic condition in which you have a problem with the, the, the ciliary, let's say, mechanisms that make sperm to, to uh, actually progress. In that condition, uh, whether you use ejaculated sample or testicular sample, the specimens will be the same. So there's no actually clear advantage of using testicular sperm in the ejaculated sperm. However, if you consider that the patient could have, let's say, better DNA integrity in the testicular sperm specimens, you might actually consider giving testicular sperm ICSI in that particular patient scenario. Not because you will be able to find motile sperm, but because you'll be able to find sperm with better DNA integrity. So in our case, in our condition here, in our center, when I have a patient like that, I prefer to give testicular sperm for the reason of having sperm with better DNA integrity. Okay, sir. So one more question is there from, uh, so okidometer used for testicular volume, uh, will it reflect the size testes of a uh, uh, testicular volume of male in different population or it's a uh, population specific? No, it's not population specific. I, I'm not aware of any study done with the orthodometer for different population. We can say that for most patients I see, because I have been traveling across the world and then examining patients in different countries, including India, including uh, Middle East, Asia, uh, I mean, uh, Europe. And I see that the orthodometer can provide, let's say, some guidance in terms of the testicular volume for, let's say, a, a different uh, population. The only thing you need to consider is that the normal, let's say, testicular volume, when you use the orthodometer, consider that the normal testicular volume is between 15 ml and 20 ml. 15, 1, 5, 2, 2, 0. 15 to 20 ml. Because some patients, obviously, there is some differences in terms of the the ethnic background, some, uh, in, in some populations, the patients are bigger, they have different, uh, uh, the way they are built uh, in terms of the bones, in terms of the genetic condition, you see that the, not always you see the testicular size of 20 ml. So between 1.5 and 20 ml, you might get 
a good appreciation of the testicular condition. If it's below 15 ml, it indicates testicular dysfunction in all populations. So you can use the orchidometer as a guidance to uh, distinguish patients with, let's say, so-called uh, testicular volumes within normal range between 15 and 20 ml and patients with reduced testicular volume, which is below 15 ml across the population that you see as well in India. Okay, sir. So now, uh, any role of varicose embolization is there in a varicosal treatment? Before it I will, yeah, I will discuss say, a treatment in one of the webinars. So I will go through the varicocele and the treatments that we have available. Embolization is certainly one of the treatments that we can use for varicocelectomy. You can treat the varicocelectomy using uh, the conventional surgical approaches, which are related to less success rates in terms of recurrence. We can use microsurgical varicocelectomy, which is my personal uh, choice which is associated with less recurrence and success rates in terms of uh, curing the varicocele are higher. And we can also use the embolization for varicocelectomy, which is also a technique that can be used. Okay, sir. So is there any role of a PIXI for beta infertility? Well, as you know, PIXI is a technique that has been promoted to select sperm with less DNA fragmentation. Uh, apparently, the way PIXI works is actually the sperm will bind to hyaluronic acid, and the sperm able to bind to hyaluronic acid are those who are more, let's say, mature. And theoretically, with less DNA fragmentation. However, uh, the latest randomized control trial, a big randomized control trial published recently showed no benefit of PICSI in terms of live birth rate among patients undergoing ICSI. This paper showed that doing PICSI or not, although it might deselect some sperm with the DNA fragmentation, in terms of live birth, this big study, which is the best study so far published, on PIXI showed that live birth rates were not affected by using PIXI or not. So we are not using PIXI at the moment in our clinic. Every time I have high DFI and I have treated the patient the way I could to decrease the DFI and the DFI is still high, we use the stickler sperm. The stickler sperm is our current approach for management of patients with high DFI in the semen after I have done something clinically to reduce the DFI. And when the DFI is still high, our approach is the stickler sperm. Uh, so one more question is there, like defects or abnormality, as you have discussed, uh, can happen because of the C uses. So are these defects are due to the procedure itself or due to the defect? Uh, used and used for XC. This is a very important question. In the in the paper that I discussed with you, that I shared this literature as well in the in the previously. So if you go to that particular paper in detail, it's a long paper, but uh, yeah, it's a very comprehensive evaluation of this uh, issue presented here as a question to me. Uh, you you see that there is evidence that the defects that we see that the increased risk in the defects in the offspring related to several conditions, chromosomal abnormalities, cancer, epigenetic issues, cardiometabolic profile, etc., is more related to the parental infertility, not ICSI per se. There's very little actually information that ICSI might, as, a, as a method of fertilization might be the cause of the defects we see, the increased risk in defects we see in this uh, patient population. So it's very unlikely that ICSI is 
the cause of these problems as a method of fertilization. The likely reason is related to parental infertility, in which we are using ICSI to overcome infertility in patients who were not able, in most of the cases, to conceive naturally or using less complex uh, techniques of a, uh, assisted conception. Okay, sir, there is one um, question on how to deal with the uh, increased semen viscosity. One, one way to deal with that is to decrease the abstinence period. Try to see if the patient can have a uh, increase the intake of fluid. A, uh, one week, five days before the semen analysis, ask the patient to take a lot of fluid ask the patient to actually provide the uh, semen uh, uh, specimen uh, with two, three days of abstinence only. And then the other thing you can do, you can, uh, if there's history of increased viscosity in previous semen analysis, you can actually include in the collection device, cultural media, one two ml of cultural media so the patient will be collecting the semen in a cup with cultural media to kind of help actually the uh, the viscosity when you homogenize then you can decrease this viscosity it's important that if it's a diagnostic semen analysis just make sure to record the amount of fluid you include in the cup for able to make the the estimations of sperm count properly. This is one way. And if you are doing for ICSI, then you can use the cultural media. There are some enzymes that you can use also in the lab. The tryptin, for instance, can be used. There are some enzymes made available as uh, salt. So you make a solution, you kind of add the enzyme trypsin. A chemotrypsin is the enzyme we use in our lab when we have the semen viscosity very high, but we only, we only use chemotrypsin in the conditions we are doing a diagnostic semen analysis. When I have a history of increased viscosity and we are going for the X cycle, IVF cycle, and then we ask the patient to collect this specimen in a cup containing uh, culture media, and then we process the, the semen accordingly, homogenizing with the pipette, trying to kind of decrease viscosity. Uh, so, uh, uh, for the non-motile sperms, is there any technique other than the conventional uh, eosin method or the osmotic met methods to, uh, to find out the viability, sir? No, in, ter in terms of the semen analysis, what is, has been approved by the WHO manual is to use the eosin test. So, for instance, you uh, if you are performing a diagnostic semen analysis, the viability test, according to the WHO, should be the eosine test. You can use the nigrosine as a background or you can use eosine alone. This is the standard. The hyposmotic swelling test is a way actually to look at also viability because there's a good correlation between the eosine results and the hyposmotic swelling test. So you can also use the hyposmotic swelling test to estimate the proportion of sperm with uh, the tail swelling, which indicates viability. And this uh, technique can also be used to select viable sperm for ICSI, provided you just expose the tip of the tail to the hyposmotic solution using the ICSI needle very, very uh, quickly to uh, identify the tail swelling and then go for ICSI. You can also use pentoxifylin, which is very good, actually, in our hands. We use quite a lot pentoxifylin to estimate, to stimulate motility. And it's quite good, especially when you increase the dosage and then you wash the sperm to kind of uh, remove after selecting the motile sperm and then you wash the sperm in the in the uh, cultural media droplets successive uh, uh, success uh, uh, in a sequential manner to remove the any residual pentoxifylin and then you can use for ICSI. 
You can also the laser shot. You can give the laser shot in the sperm tail if you have the laser device. When using ICSI, you can use a, a laser shot to see the tail swelling. Also, another technique to identify motile sperm. And we can also use the tail flexibility test, which is a test that we kind of put sperm in the PVP before ICSI, use the tip of the ICSI needle to move the tail up and down. And when it's flexible, so the sperm is not moving uh, as a whole, but the tail is moving with some flexibility, it can be used for, for ICSI to find um, viable sperm when you have only normal type sperm. Uh, hopefully, sir, this is the last question for you. Uh, so, for and if you see if you see vacuolation in the sperm head, so any any uh, any treatment you can suggest, sir. Well, I don't believe very much in in uh, any technique like uh, suggesting that the vacuolation vacualization in sperm head. Uh, is actually detrimental. You know, a lot of people are using INSEE uh, across the globe, but I hope in future less and less people will use this technique because it has not been proven to increase the life birth rates in, uh, in ICSI treatment. Perhaps for some very selected population, uh, it might actually help to select sperm with better DNA integrity. But one important thing to consider is that vacualization is part of, it, of sperm, spermatogenesis and spermiogenesis. It's common to find sperm in, to find vac vacuous in human sperm. This is common. During the process of spermiogenesis, you see that sperm from normal man will have vacuous. This is normal. Uh, it does not indicate automatically that the sperm quality is poor. However, if you have a very big vacuum that might, uh, let's say, be associated with some abnormalities in the membrane, and perhaps not in the nucleus, but in the membrane, or perhaps in the nucleus, in that particular condition, if you are doing ICSI, you might be able to, using the normal ICSI, you just increase the optical magnification from 400 times. Some people you do ICSI using 200 times magnification. You increase to 400 times. In some microscopes, you can increase to 800 times magnification. It's going to be very easy to see the vacuums without the need to you rely on IMSI. And you can deselect sperm with big vacuums. Well, there is uh, some uh, uh, medication, some uh, gonadotoxin medication, especially some antibiotics that have been associated with increase in the, uh, in the frequency of big vacuums uh, in sperm. So the only advice I can give you is ask the patient properly if you see this condition, if he's taking any gonadotoxin medication, specifically use of any antibiotics in, in previous weeks or days, uh, and if there's exposure to heat that could cause some problems in this, let's say, spermiogenic defects, and they are leading to uh, more vacuums in the sperm head. Apart from that, there is no treatment actually to decrease the frequency of vacuums, keeping in mind that the small vacuums is part of the spermiogenesis process. Thank you so much, sir. It's almost two and a half hours since we are since you started talking and started your lecture, and it's uh, thank you very much for such an elaborate session, sir. So I thank you very much for your attention and uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to discuss yeah. more with you in the next yeah. webinar. More, more, more and more questions will be there in the uh, treatment part of sessions. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Have, a, have a great evening. Goodbye. Okay,